Many games have a design element in which a player who is behind in points can score more easily than the leader. Take the Quacks of Quacksalber, for example, in which the scoreboard has rat tails every two or three spaces on the scoring track. For each rat tail that you are behind the leader, in your cauldron, you are going to advance a rat token one space. So you start farther up the track than the leader, which gives you an edge in scoring points and bubbles, which is the currency in the game, in that particular round. If you do catch up, now you're fewer rat tails behind, which means you will have less of a jump on the leader. Now, this is an example of a catch-up mechanism, and that name tells you very baldly what it is meant to do. It also suggests that the element is somewhat tacked on to the game itself. You can play the Quacks of Quacksalber and ignore the rat tails completely. It is not necessary for you to play the game. It's really on top of what the game actually is. So it's not integrated thoroughly in the design. It's there for a purpose because the game has a lot of luck to it. It has a press your luck element. You can take chances and you can fail. And this gives you a way to get back into the game. And there are certain ways that you can possibly use it to your advantage. But in general, when you score, you're not going to score less than you could so that you get the rat tail bonus. Points are still more important than anything else. And the rat tails are there just to kind of scoot you along. Now, some designs use a catch-up mechanism more naturally than this. Chris Berm's abstract strategy game Yinch came, came out in 2003 is perfect at this because in that game, you have five rings that are placed on a board and you are going to be moving those rings in various ways on the board. And when you move, you're going to leave markers behind and you're trying to make five in a row in your color. And when you do that, you are going to score or register your score in the game by removing one of your rings from the board and putting it on the score track, which now means you have four rings on the board versus your opponent who has five. So you are ahead in the score, but you have fewer things with which to move. And the first player who removes three rings wins. So the closer you are to winning, the harder it is for you to get things done. It feels very natural in terms of how it's designed and it's not a separate catch-up mechanism, it's integrated into how the game plays. Now, the title I'm talking about today, Templari, which has been published under a couple of different names, we'll talk about that later, is very much a game in which the catch-up mechanism essentially is the game. The game itself is a very streamlined design in which you are trying to score the most points, but generally, the more stuff you have, the harder it is for you to do anything. Let me explain. Here are the components for Templari, 60 cardboard coin tokens with each player starting with 12 coins and a deck of 30 cards with these cards coming in six colors and with each color appearing five times. The numbers on the cards range from zero to nine with each number appearing three times, always on different colors. So the four appears on brown, green, and blue, while the eight are on gray, yellow, and pink. So you have different combinations of everything. To play the game, you're going to shuffle the cards and bid on cards in lots of two 15 times. That's it, 15 auctions and then you score. That's it for the game. So we turn over two cards. First thing up for bid, you just put in your bid if you want. I'm gonna bid two and then someone else goes around and we keep going. If someone passes, they're out for the round and the winning bid gets put in the center. So if I win with a bit of six, I'm going to put the cards in front of me and I'll leave them here so you can see what I have. The money goes into the pot and then it's split evenly among the other players. So in a five player game, each player gets one and two is left behind in the pot. We would then turn over two new cards and I would start the bidding for the next round with whatever money amount I want up to the maximum of what I have. Now, what you're trying to do is collect cards of the same color because at the end of the game, you will score points for those cards with, for each color separately. And the scoring is triangular. So if you have one card of a color, it's one point, two cards is three, and then you have six, 10, and 15 points if you get all five cards of a color. So I definitely want this brown 
because it'll go with the brown I already have. You have six colors, so often you don't have a lot that flips over perfectly that matches what you're collecting. You do the best you can with what you're getting, similar to Michael Schock's Colorado. So I can bid, however, when you have cards in front of you, those restrict the bids that you can make. I cannot make a bid that would end with any number that I have in front of me. So I cannot make a bid that ends with a one or two. So the minimum I can bid is three, and I could not bid 11 or 12, should I have that much money, which I don't right now, but I cannot make that bid. So I can bid four if I want, but not one or two. I have only six money because I won the first bid with six. There's a good chance that someone else is going to bid higher than me and I will not win these. If I did win them, again, my money would go into the pool and it'd be split evenly among everyone else. If someone else makes a bid that happens to end with a one or two, let's say someone really wants these cards for some reason, I don't know why, and they bid 11, their bid ends with a one and I have a one, their entire bid and any money left in the pot would go to me. It's a very strange system, but that's how it works. So probably someone won't make a bid that ends with one right now because it would give me a ton of cash and help me win things in the future. So someone else will probably win this, money will get distributed, but now they own a two and six. So now that player can't make a bid that ends with a two or six. I can't make bids that end with one or two. But if someone wins with a bid of six, then this player gets all the money. If someone ends with a bid of two, then we would split the money because each of us has a two. Hmm. So the more you win, let's say I win this bid, now I can't make bids in the future that end with a one, two, four, or seven. I am squeezing the possible numbers that I can bid three, five, six, eight, nine, zero. So I can bid up to 10 and then 13 would be the next one. If I won this one, I would be squeezed even further with my future bids possible only being three, six, eight, nine, 13, 16, 18, 19, and so on. It makes it harder for me to bid the more that I win. You're going to go through the deck, 15 auctions total, that's it. You're going to then score for your colors. This right now is 1.3.13, eight points, and whoever has the most money at the end has two points for their money. Templari was released in 2017 by French publisher Igari, but this was not the first time that this Michael Schock design was released. That was 2001 when German publisher Queen Games released Don and was, as far as I know, not sued by Marlon Brando for this cover. Maybe Brando's lawyers were not paying attention to small card games coming out in other countries. I don't know. It was a different time, 2001. Now, Don has you as mobsters that are trying to control districts in Chicago. It was released in Queen's short-lived butter box format where you were lifting off the top as if a butter dish. Uh, the cards stand on the end, on the side, which is a little awkward, and you've got the bag of plastic components here, which then you sort of have to mush down properly to somehow get everything back on and have the top actually close. It's a little hard to fit, and you can understand why they did not use this. But again, you are mobsters controlling districts in Chicago, and that setting kind of makes sense because if I control a six, and then someone else does business in the six, that is they make a bid that ends with six, they're doing business in my territory, so I get the money, I control it, they gotta have the payoff to me. And I'm not gonna make a bid of six because I'm not gonna mess in my own territory, I'm gonna go somewhere else and cause trouble by trying to control things. It makes sense in a very abstract way, but when you boil it all down, you've got numbers on colored cards and you're making bids for stuff, to try to get things to score points. It's pretty much a naked game design that can fit any kind of setting. It's more decorative than anything else, which is apparent because in 2006, 
German publisher Abacus Spiele released the game as Serengeti, where you were collecting African art. And now for Templari, you are, I guess, collecting parts of armor for Templar Knights. All the sixes have this weapon, and all the nines have the shield, and the zeros have this sword, and so on. So if you have color issues, you can see this, and you know that it's a zero. It doesn't necessarily help you with the colors, what you're trying to get, but possibly they're all different for you. I'm not sure. I do not have color recognition issues, so I have not tested it along those lines. But the theme is irrelevant, pretty much. You're just having 15 auctions, running through them all, and trying to magically end up with the right selection of cards, but they're going to come out at random, two at a time. Who knows what you're going to end up with? The money flows back and forth around in a pool, similar to Reiner Knizia's Trum Fabrique. It's a closed auction system, so all the money goes to other people, possibly just one person, possibly a couple of people, possibly everyone, depending on what numbers have been claimed. And the games vary a lot depending on how the cards come out. Sometimes, some games you'll have certain numbers that just don't appear until very late in the game, and so people keep trying to make these safe bids where it's like the two and the seven. No one owns those, so I'm gonna bid those so it splits up the money rather than give money to someone in particular. You can try to win certain numbers, but of course, you don't know how they're going to come out. So again, the game has a lot of variability in how it plays out. One recent game, the first cards that came out were six and seven, and I thought I'd claim those to sort of have this space for myself, where if someone didn't want me to get money, they had to jump the gap to go up to at least eight. And unfortunately, most people just did that. I rarely ended up with any money with six and seven until other people also had those numbers and we were splitting it. So it was a fairer distribution of the funds rather than me just getting everything. And that's how the game plays out. It's very, it, it's very varied in how things happen depending on what people get, where sometimes people make these early wins for cards and then they're very hamstrung in what they get. And I've seen games where people get to where they can only make two legitimate bid numbers based on what they have and then it's very hard for them because, of course, you spend the money, you get below a certain threshold, and we know that you can only bid three. That's it. You don't even have eight money. You can't bid that, so my opening bid is three, and it just shuts you out completely. And it's a great dynamic that's all about interacting with the other players and trying to finagle things so it all works your way, but again, you're up to the randomness of how the cards come out. Maybe you're collecting green and two green cards get flipped at once, all in. I will just, I want that. It's gonna pay off for me in the long run. I don't care what bids I'm locked out of just cause I want those colors and I'm all set. And then other times you worry about overlapping numbers. Okay, sixes and sevens, that's great. Their don't, colors don't match, but whatever. I'm gonna get all of the money or two thirds of the money, depending on if someone else gets another six or seven. It changes a lot. Now, one difference between the games. So Don and Templari work a little differently. Uh, first of all, again, this has coins for six people. This has coins for only five people. You can just use supplemental coins to go up to six people. The gameplay does not change, except that in Dawn, the auctions are run a little bit differently, where you flip over one card, and you have a one card lot, and then two cards, and then three cards. And then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Templari is just two cards every single time. And I suppose that difference is more to release the... Uh, lessen the luck of having a single card flip over and one player is the only person who cares about that color. Now you always have two cards come out and you rarely have cards of the same color and so you have more people fighting for certain lots when you have two cards all the time. Whereas the one, two, three, although the three card lot sometimes it gives a different dynamic to the bidding because the number that you bid each time varies more. So there's differences between the two and one is not necessarily better than the other. They just have a slightly different feel for how they come out with more even bids in the two, two card system, 
less lucky flips, fewer lucky flips. And then with one to three, more variability, more dynamic, more chance for luck, more where you can just hope that things go your way, depending on how things flip at a certain time. You can still have lucky flips in the Templari version. Uh, last game, someone had, I think it was pink and gray, and then a lot comes out that was pink and gray, and then another lot was pink and gray. And so that was pretty much what they were collecting. And all right, fine, be that way. So there you go. Quick overview of Don Templari. Again, pretty much the same game with a similar color scheme. Interesting to see. So fascinating game to see and play. Uh, copies are probably not available in the retail market. We had a few left in the BGG store in mid-2021. You can probably find them used relatively easily. I just thought I'd highlight a game that doesn't have a lot of attention, is not super flashy, is not something that will make an evening, but it is very simple to play and get into and has this dynamic feel that is not like anything else because it's it's amazing to see again the more you get the harder it is to do things you can feel yourself sort of being pulled off this cliff with all your winnings and you just hope that you can survive until the end of the game and then possibly somehow add just a little bit more to it to ensure that you end up on top 